Last week we thought about our hearts before God from Isaiah chapter 29. And in 2024, I don't know about you, but I want to draw near to God in my heart. That's the gospel, isn't it? That Christ died in order that we can come to God, draw near to him, not just in word or in deed and the things we, we do, but with our hearts, we can have a relationship with the living Lord God. So in 2024, I want to draw near to God in my heart, but I also have plans for 2024. I wonder whether you have a plan for the year. I wonder whether you are a planner or you're just someone who just lets life come at you and the way it comes. Do you have plans for 2024? Do you make plans for the day at the start of a day? And my question this morning is, how do we plan in a godly way? How do we plan in a godly way? And we're going to learn from a bad example, the nation of Israel in Isaiah chapter 30. And I'm going to read to you Isaiah 30, verses 1 to 5. The Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah. This is what it says. Our stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine. Who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. For though his officials are at Zoan and his envoys reach Hanes, everyone comes to shame through a people that cannot profit them. That brings neither help nor profit, but shame and disgrace. At the moment in history when Isaiah spoke those words, when God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, Israel has been invaded by the Assyrian Empire. There was a southern kingdom of Israel, uh, sorry, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel and they've split and the northern kingdom of Israel has been conquered by the Assyrian Empire. And Judah is next. Jerusalem is in Judah. And the primary message of the book of Isaiah has been invasion is coming because of your sin, Judah. You have rejected God. You have forsaken God. You have disobeyed his commandments. You have worshipped idols made of stone and wood and precious metals. And therefore, the invasion of the Assyrians is coming. And so the appropriate response to that message is to repent, is to turn away from idols, turn away from sin, turn away from disobedience and turn back to God and run to God for help. Please, Lord, have mercy. Help us in this season. That's the appropriate response, isn't it? If this invasion is coming because of their disobedience to God, the appropriate response is to turn and trust in God once again. But that is not what the people of Judah do. We've just read what the people of Judah do. They send ambassadors to Egypt, to Pharaoh. Verse 4 says that their officials and envoys have already reached Zoan and Hanes, which are in the south of Egypt. So Judah have sent their ambassadors to Egypt and they want the protection and shelter of Pharaoh. This is a very foolish, foolish plan. If you know the history of the people of Israel, you know that they were saved out of slavery in Egypt. Pharaoh was an enemy of God. At the beginning of the book of Exodus, Pharaoh says, I'm going to kill the firstborn sons of the nation of Egypt because they're becoming too numerous. They're doing too well. And so Pharaoh sets himself up in opposition to God's people. Why would you go back to Egypt, to Pharaoh, for help and shelter when you know the history of your relationship with that nation? Why would you ignore the Lord God Almighty and seek help from a mere man? In that sense, they're adding sin to sin. They've sinned. And therefore the Assyrians have come to invade. And in response, instead of re repenting and turning back to God, 
the people of Judah say, well, let's go back to Egypt. They're sinning in going back to Egypt for protection. And consequently, Egypt's help will prove ineffective. It will bring shame and disgrace, it says in verse 5. This is a bad, bad plan. Now, as we see the terrible planning of the people of Judah, I want us to learn about how to make godly plans, how to make plans of the Spirit. And before I get into the detail of Isaiah 30 and think about this topic of how do we make godly plans, I need to emphasise this. God is sovereign. That means he is king and he directs all things which happen on the earth. God is king. God is sovereign. He has a plan which he executes. Let me read to you from James chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. It says this. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That's a verse about God's sovereignty, about the fact that we can make plans, but God is ultimately in control. So when we make plans, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, this is what we're going to do. Proverbs 16 verse 9 says, The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I make a plan in my heart, but it is God who establishes what actually happens and the steps that take place. And so everything I say about making plans this morning ought to be understood in light of this bigger, more important truth. That God is king and his plan will always come to fruition for he is God. We might have a great plan for 2024 already. Well, God might have a different one for you. And that's a good thing because God is wiser than you. He has a truly eternal perspective. We try and think with an eternal perspective, don't we, as Christians? But God ultimately has that eternal perspective. He can see all things. And God's love for you is deep and personal and eternal. So... So making plans, humans making plans is a good thing. It's okay to make plans. It's good to make plans. But sometimes God says, well, my plan for you is better. And that's a wonderful thing to rejoice about because of his love for us, because he's going to use all things for our good. God uses all things for the good of those who love him. And he has this wisdom and eternal perspective, which is far, far greater than yours or mine. So we make plans for 2024. Knowing God's plans might ruin our plans, but in a good way. And we rejoice in God's sovereignty. So, what can we learn from Isaiah chapter 30 about making godly plans? Well, the first thing is this. Plan to stay with God. Don't go back. Think like an Israelite with me just for a moment when you hear these prophetic words. You know that your people long ago were saved out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land, a land that was flowing with milk and honey. But now the Assyrians are invading and life in the promised land is hard. And the Israelite is thinking, maybe it would be better if we'd stayed in Egypt. Maybe we should go back and take shelter there. This this life in the promised land, this is much tougher than I imagined. I expected to just be drinking from the river of milk and eating honey that was just falling from the sky and now we're being invaded. This is much harder than I realised. I think I might go back to Egypt. Sometimes that same temptation can come in the Christian walk. You become a Christian. You believe in Jesus. And it's amazing. God loves me. I'm saved for eternity. 
Jesus Christ, God the Son, loved me so much he died on the cross for me. And then he rose again in power and defeated death. And I've been baptised and I've been washed clean from my sin and I, I'm raised to new life. Being a Christian is awesome. It's amazing. I'm forgiven. I'm blessed. I love being a Christian. It's so, so good. But then it gets harder. Friends and family mock you for what you believe. You're persevering in disciplines like prayer and church going and you feel tired and this is hard work. And then there are temptations to sin. There are temptations to do things that you know to be wrong. Things that you used to do in your old life and now you're living your new life and these temptations come and you feel like you're in a battle with those temptations. And then maybe you mess up and you feel guilty for what you've done. And then maybe there are consequences for the sin that you committed. And suddenly you're in this place of going, Christian, being a Christian is hard. And instead of repenting and asking God for mercy and for strength, you're thinking, life was easier without God. Maybe I should give up. Maybe I should go back to my old life. I wonder whether you've ever had thoughts like that in your walk with God. It's a foolish thought to forsake the God of love and joy who offers eternal salvation to those who trust in Christ, who gives purpose to our lives. With him, even through hard times, we can have joy. And Christ offers to Christians a peace that is unsurpassable. He is the God of power who works all things for the good of those who love him. So, yes, there are times when being a Christian is difficult. But to forsake God and to walk away from him is a foolish thought. You will not find greater joy and greater peace away from God. You won't. To think that is as foolish as Israel thinking Maybe we should go back to our former slave masters for protection. So if we're going to plan well, our first most important plan must be this. I'm staying with God. Whatever comes in 2024, whatever comes, God in Jesus Christ will be my refuge and my shelter. When storms come, I won't run away from God, but I will run to God. When I sin and I mess up, and all of us sin and mess up, I will repent and turn to Christ for mercy. Jesus, forgive me. I know that you died for me and all my sin is forgiven. And so we don't run away from God when we sin, but we run to him again. Even death, if it comes in 2024 will not separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. For that's what it says in Romans 8, verses 38 to 39, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible teaches that truly born again believers in Christ will persevere in faith. God preserves us and we persevere. And so, and so as God preserves us through the power of the Holy Spirit, through all these wonderful blessings, we persevere. And, and God wants you to persevere in faith in 2024. And so make that your plan. Above all things, in 2024, I'm going to persevere in faith. I'm going to persevere with God. I'm going to take refuge in the protection of God. I'm going to seek shelter in the shadow of Christ's wings. And God's protection will not turn to shame, but honour and glory and eternal life. So stick with God, do not forsake him for Egypt. Secondly, if we're going to make godly plans, we need to seek God's direction. Have a look at verse 2. It says that the leaders of Judah had set out to go down to Egypt without asking for God's direction. They had not asked. They come up with this grand plan for surviving invasion and they had not sought God. I wonder if you've been so arrogant and proud as to plan things in 2024 without asking for God's direction. 
And if that's true, then correct that as soon as you can. As a church, we are devoting a week in January to prayer, seeking and hearing from God because we want his direction. The elders have prayed and met and, and made plans, but we want to keep seeking God and we want his will for our church. And so we're devoting a whole week of prayer, evening after evening, gathering together to pray and to lift up 2024 and say, God, your will be done. We, we want, merely want to be your servants and to follow you. So you do what you will. And we will spend time listening and asking him to speak. Personally, for 2024, I've made some plans. I have a Bible reading plan that I will follow, hopefully, in 2024. Rachel and I have started to plan a holiday in 2024 as well. But surely it is right and good for me and for you to set time aside, maybe this afternoon, to pray and to read the Bible and to say, Lord, I'm seeking your direction for 2024. Now, when I do that this afternoon, I'm not certain that God will speak audibly with grand plans for 2024. He might do. He might speak to me with grand plans for next year. But most importantly of all, even if I don't hear clearly from him in that moment, he will have met me and set my heart on the right appropriate course. And so I think it's a good yearly habit and a good daily habit to say, Lord, direct me and to give God an opportunity to speak. And I would encourage you to do that this afternoon. And actually, as I was writing this sermon, I stopped at this moment and did precisely what I was preaching. I shouldn't be someone who just says things, but actually does what I'm speaking. And so I stopped writing my sermon and I prayed and I waited. And you know, God didn't speak in a clear prophetic voice in that moment to me, but then I opened my Bible and God did speak to me. He spoke to me from Isaiah chapter 49, which happened to be the chapter that I was reading in my Bible reading plan that I've not finished for 2023. And I was reminded that I exist for God's glory and that the light of Christ's salvation might shine through me to others. And so I prayed that into 2024. Lord, I want to exist solely for your glory and I want the light of Christ to shine through me that others might receive salvation, that salvation might be go to the nations, which is what those verses say. So why not do that this afternoon? Set aside time to pray and say, Lord, direct me. Wait and listen and open the Bible and hear God's voice. For when we open the Bible, we always hear God speaking to us, for these are his words. So if we want to make godly plans, we need to plan to stay with God, to stick with him, and we need to ask for God's direction. Thirdly, we need to make plans which are of God's spirit. In verse one, God says to the Israelites, you Israelites, you carry out a plan, but it's not my plan. You make an alliance, but it's not of my spirit. What you are doing is not of the Holy Spirit. When we make plans, we want to make plans which are of the Holy Spirit. So how do we do that? How as Christians do we make plans which are of the Holy Spirit? How is it that the Holy Spirit helps us to plan? Well, I want to share with you three ways in which the Holy Spirit helps us when we plan. Firstly, through the word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, the scriptures are God breathed. These words are God breathed. And the Holy Spirit is described throughout the Bible as the breath of God. And so we believe that the Holy Spirit is the author of God's word. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Human hands wrote this but the Holy Spirit was, was, was the breath that was giving the words that we read in the Bible. New Frontiers has this phrase, this motto. We're at New Frontiers Church, if you're visiting this morning. But New Frontiers has this phrase and motto that's used for many, many years, which is that we are word and spirit churches. We're a word and spirit church. And some people hear that phrase and they think they're like opposites. 
You know, some people are word people. Duncan, he's a word person. He loves to read the Bible and preach from the Bible. He's a word person. He's down this end of the spectrum. And there are other people who are like really prophetic and wacky and crazy. And they're the spirit people. There's spirit people and there's word people. And in your tears, we kind of think hopefully they'll hang out together and be friends. They speak about word and spirit like they are opposites. And I say to that, that's absolute nonsense. The Holy Spirit is the author of the word. If you love the Holy Spirit, you will love the word of God, for these are his words. Even the most prophetic of people hear God more often and most clearly through the Bible. And if you love the word, you will love the Holy Spirit, for he is the author and his necessity to exist and his power is described all the way through this book. You are, if you don't like the Holy Spirit, you are not a word person. You are not of the Bible. And if you don't like the Bible, you are not a very spiritual person. You can't, to be word and spirit is to love the presence of the Holy Spirit, to love all the gifts of the Spirit and to love the word which the Spirit has spoken to us. Even the most learned biblical scholar will be useless for God unless he or she also knows the presence and power of God through the Holy Spirit in their life. So if you want to make plans of the Holy Spirit, hear God in the word. Read the Bible and seek to live it out. I think this is what Francis's word was all about, by the way. People who go, I'm waiting on God. I'm not going to do anything until I hear God speak. I'm just going to sit. I'm not going to even... The Holy Spirit will speak to me and tell me what to have for breakfast this morning. I will not move. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is to seek God and ask for his direction and give him an opportunity to speak in that moment, but then to say, well, I can hear from God right here and I know what he has instructed me to do, so I will read this and I will go and do what it says. And that is the Spirit speaking. Hear God in the Word, read the Bible, and seek to live it out. Make reading the Bible a spiritual experience. Pray through what you've read. Preach the gospel to yourself as you read it and plan to live it out. Let me give you an example. We've just read Isaiah chapter 30. And I've just preached on seeking direction from God. So all of us should have just made a plan in our head to say, when am I going to do that? When am I going to go and spend time asking God for direction? Do you see? We hear the word and we hear it preached and we go, well, I'm going to act on that. I'm not just going to sit and listen and go, oh, that was a nice sermon and then go home. I'm going to act on what was said. So read the word, all of it but especially the Gospels and life of Jesus Christ? Think about these kind of questions. How does the life, death and resurrection and salvation that Christ brings change my plan today? Am I going to live in light of the salvation of Christ today? What difference does that make? And also ask, how can I follow his example? How can I be like Christ? I just want to speak to you about the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, this is what those words say. Let me read them to you again. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The sufficiency of scripture teaches that in this book we have everything we need to be equipped for every good work which God would have us do. This Bible teaches us all that we need to know from God. Now books and sermons and other Christians encouraging us and, and prophecies and all those things are wonderful things that help us grow and learn and move us forward. But we should not think that we need those things in order to do anything. We're not, we don't need to sit and wait and, and, oh, I don't have what I need before I can go and live the Christian life. No, here we have what is sufficient to equip us for every good work. 
And some of the things it tells us to do in here is to seek the spiritual gifts like prophecy. But do not think that the Christian life is sitting and waiting for something we do not have. No, the Christian is equipped for every good work through the scriptures. That's what the sufficiency of scripture means as a doctrine. So how can we make plans of the spirit? Read the word. And I would encourage each and every one of you to think about your Bible reading plan for 2024 so that you don't just read your favourite chapter over and over again throughout the year, but you really soak in different parts. And if you read parts that you find difficult, then come and chat to me. I'd love, I'd love it if people were going, Duncan, come and, oh, come and tell me what the temple in Ezekiel is all about. And I'll go, I don't know, I need to do some reading and some prayer about that. But, you know, find, if you find things in the scripture that you don't understand, come and speak to your life group or to me. I'd love to have those conversations. Let's embrace the word this year. <coughs> Secondly, how do we make plans of the Spirit? Well, consider the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, says the fruit of the Spirit is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are qualities that will naturally flow from the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, but I also think there are qualities that we should plan to, to live out. We should ask ourselves, if love is a fruit of the spirit, and I want to be a spiritual person in 2024, how can I love people? Is there a way I can express more joy in my life? Because joy is a fruit of the spirit. Can I plan something to help feel more peaceful? I want to plan acts of kindness in 2024. I want to be faithful in 2024. I've signed up to a life group. I'm going to keep going faithfully because faithfulness is a fruit of the spirit. I don't just go, OK, those are the fruits. Right. Let's leave them. They're just going to come through naturally. I go, no, I want to live these things out. I love the spirit. I want him to work through me. So Holy Spirit, help me be loving today. What can I do? Help me be faithful today. What can I do? Love, kindness and faithfulness and all the fruits of the spirit aren't less spiritual when they are planned. That's not less spiritual to make up. No. Use the fruit to plan days and months and years. How can I be more loving tomorrow than I am today? Thirdly, how can we make plans that of the spirit? Seek to hear God <coughs> prophetically. We know God speaks in and through the word in the Bible, but we also know that prophecy is a gift that God gives today. To prophesy is the gift of receiving and communicating an immediate message of God. So this is God's word for all time and for all places, for all generations. But God chooses to speak an immediate message to churches and to individuals, a timely word that is required. And those prophecies can come through visions, words, dreams, even sometimes physical actions. Ezekiel um, had to lie on his side for many, many days, which sounds like a really rough thing that God asked him to do. But God speaks in lots of different ways. These immediate words. And sometimes God does speak to an individual on their own, and an application of today is to spend time waiting on God and asking him to give you prophetic words for yourself. But God takes particular pleasure in the church functioning together. Israel, what were Israel meant to do with this prophecy? They're meant to go, we need to pray and seek God's direction. And then we need to gather together the prophets and hear what the prophets of God are going to say. That's what the Israel was meant to do. Well, what are we meant to do with this word? We're meant to say, OK, Lord, direct me. And we're meant to gather with the church and, and listen to the prophecies that come and hear from God in that way. Why not grab a couple of friends at some point in the next week ahead and pray with them and listen together and prophesy to one another on a Sunday? Ask someone to pray for you and maybe they will prophesy over you as they pray. Be ready to receive from God, but also to give as well. Lord, would you speak to me in order that I might prophesy into someone else's plan for 2024? If you've got a particularly big decision to make, and sometimes we come to that place, we've got a big decision to make, share it with others in the church. Ask them to pray about it and to seek God on your behalf. 
That's a belief in the prophetic, that God can speak. That's a belief that in the church and us working together. Sometimes God doesn't speak really clearly prophetically. And in that instance, perhaps we've been given freedom to make a choice ourselves. And I find that often. When it came to planting a church in Fareham, God spoke very, very clearly in multiple ways through multiple people. This is, Duncan, this is what I'm calling you to do. But on other occasions, God's given me a freedom to make my own choice. But I try to give him opportunity to speak into every big decision that I make. So making plans for 2024, or making plans for the rest of today, or making plans for tomorrow, three ways. Three things we ought to do. Plan to stick with God, seek God's direction, and make plans of the Holy Spirit by reading the word, meditating on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and seeking the gift of prophecy. But I want to finish my sermon this morning with a lesson in God's grace. Judah did not make godly plans in Isaiah chapter 30, did it? Judah made a terrible plan. Uh, they went away from God. They sought shelter from Egypt. As a consequence, Assyria marched through Judah in successful conquest after successful conquest. All the cities of Judah were conquered by the Assyrians, apart from one. Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, had conquered every town and city and he besieged Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And his spokesperson, a man called Rabshakeh, said this to the Israelites. He stood outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Maybe he's leaning casually, surrounded by an Assyrian army. And he says to the, he says to the people of Judah, Behold, you are now trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Isn't that a funny quote? Hey, you've trusted in Egypt, and if you lean on Egypt, you know what to do? It's like leaning on a really sharp spear. It's a stupid idea. You're going to get pierced. You're going to get stung by Egypt. And this man mocks and taunts Jerusalem, and mocks and taunts God outside Jerusalem city gates. King Hezekiah tears his clothes, and they call the prophet Isaiah into the courtroom. And Isaiah says, Do not be afraid. Hezekiah tears his clothes, prays, calls the prophet, and Isaiah says, do not be afraid. God says, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Do you know what it says in 1 Kings 19 verse 35? That night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians wake up in the morning their army destroyed and they go home. It's not just the Bible, by the way, that describes this event. You can go into the British Museum and see a hexagonal cylinder written by King Sennacherib, which tells the story of his conquests in Judah. And if you read it, you'll, you'll see he... Uh, you won't be able to read it because it's in a uh, very old language. But if you read the translation, you'll see that he conquered one city and he conquered another city. And then he says, and Judah gave me loads of tribute and I was really rich and I was awesome and amazing. And then I besieged Jerusalem and then we went home. That's what the cylinder says. Like this is a historical event that you can read about in the British Library. He conquers everywhere, but he doesn't conquer Jerusalem. If you read the Greek historian Herodotus, he says, he, he guesses, that some mice went in the camp and spread diseases so that the Assyrians' army was destroyed and they had to go home. This is a historic event. This definitely happened, but it wasn't mice. It wasn't mice. It was the angel of the Lord. It was God acting in grace. These people in Jerusalem did not deserve God's grace. They had sought the protection of Egypt. They deserved to be conquered. And in that final moment, the king prays. And God says... I will show you mercy. And he sends out his angel. Isn't that the good news of Christianity? We've made plans in our lives and they've not been godly plans. We've tried to do things and they've not been of the Holy Spirit. At least that's what my life looks like. I've tried to do things and they've not been of God. And then in a moment of desperation, I cried out to God and he showed me grace and mercy and he turned what was a terrible plan into something that was good for me. 
and he does it all the time in our lives, and that's the gospel. If you believe in Christ, maybe you've lived your whole life, you've planned everything, but you've never believed in Christ, you can turn now and believe in him, and God will show you grace and welcome you into his family, into his kingdom. You will receive love and joy and eternal salvation because that word grace means unmerited favour, undeserved blessing. And all we need to do is ask God for it and he will send out his angels to protect us. Let's make plans of the Spirit in 2024. Let's stay with God through all things. Let's seek his direction. Let's make plans from the word and from the fruit of the Spirit and from prophetic words that we've received. Let us remember that God is a God of grace and mercy and he has <coughs> saved us. Let me pray for us. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for 2023. Thank you for all the good things that you've done. Even when it's been hard, you have been with us always. We thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. And Lord, we want to pray for 2024. And I want to say, Lord, have your way in that year, in us as a church and in us as individuals. Do your will. Lord, we want to seek your direction. And would you speak now to people, Lord? Give, give things to people that, that you would have them do next year, that you would have them step into. Lord, that, that thing that maybe someone's run away from, I pray you would just drop that into someone's mind now, that they would return to God and do the thing that you have given. And Lord, even if you don't speak prophetically to us, I pray you would speak to us through the word. I thank you that you have spoken through the word. And may we be people of the word and spirit as we hear from you and live our lives, that we might make godly plans. For Lord, we want to live for you every single day of our lives. May this afternoon be a day walking in a plan of the Spirit for your glory. But more than any of that, Lord, we thank you for grace. We do not deserve your favour in our lives. We do not deserve salvation. But Christ came and Christ died and Christ rose again and Christ ascended into heaven that we might have eternal salvation. Thank you for that grace in our lives. Lord, we want to live in, in gratitude and thankfulness of what you have done for us. We love that you are a God of grace and we pray that we would glorify you with all that we do. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.